Ya que ya viene la revolución, para que se asustan será pa' mejor. Es el pueblo entero el que ya está gritando, ¡Viva la revolución! Iranian nuclear weapons development. They have turned the island into a communist hellhole. The experiment in Venezuela has failed completely. La bestialidad imperialista. Bestialidad que no tiene una frontera determinada ni pertenece a un país determinado. Bestias fueron las hordas hitleristas, como bestias son los norteamericanos hoy, como bestias son los paracaidistas belgas, como bestias fueron los imperialistas franceses en Argelia. Porque es la naturaleza del imperialismo la que bestializa a los hombres, la que la convierte en fieras sedientas de sangre que están dispuestas a degollar, a asesinar, a destruir hasta la última imagen de un revolucionario, de un partidario de un régimen que haya caído bajo su bota o que luche por su libertad. Y la estatua que recuerda a Lumumba, hoy destruida pero mañana reconstruida, nos recuerda también en la historia trágica de ese mártir de la revolución del mundo, que no se puede confiar en el imperialismo, pero ni tantito así, nada. The first time that I stepped on Soviet soil, I felt myself a full human being, a full human being. So it is unthinkable to me today that colored peoples in any part of the world would ever join a war or attacks upon the Soviet Union. They say that actually every time that I enter the ring, in a way, I'm going to war. They say to me daily, you are a prize fighter, what's the difference? And I like to say to those critics of the press and to the others that There is one hell of a lot of difference in fighting in the rain and going to war in Vietnam. Boxing is nothing like going to war with machine guns, bazookas, hang grenades, bomber airplanes. My intention is to box to win a clean fight, but in war, The intention is to kill, 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 and continue killing innocent people. That's what the versus law. Our problem has been, as black people, we've always been concerned about white America, never about us. And what we've always thought is that white America equal the same interest as us. That is not true. We must now be concerned with us. Let me give you some examples. We always want to prove what good Americans we are. The very first man to die for the war of independence in this country was a black man named Crispus Adams. Crispus Adams. He was a fool. Because here he was dying for white folk freedom and millions of his brothers were enslaved in the very country. Oh, but we wanted to prove what great Americans we were. We begged the white folk to let us fight in the war of independence and they said no. So we organized ourselves in bands of armies, training ourselves with our bare foot to prove to the white folk what great Americans we were. Please let us fight, white folk. And finally they came and inspected our troops and said, good niggas, you can fight. And they had us fighting the Indians. Like fools, we should have teamed up with the Indians and take care of you know who.
the legendary Kwame Ture, one of my favorite revolutionaries, a hero to many, a hero to African indigenous, all colonized, oppressed, working class peoples around the world. What's up, everybody? Welcome to episode 70, Unmasking Imperialism, Exposing Imperialist Propaganda in Mainstream Media. Today, the weaponization of empathy, how the war mongers in Wall Street are trying to fuck with our heads to try to push us into a new war against Russia, against China, against all anti-imperialist countries around the world. We're going to expose the weaponization of empathy, especially focusing on what's going on with Ukraine and Russia, how mainstream media is victimizing Ukraine while demonizing Russia, how that works, how that is supposed to push us into a new renewed war. Uh, we're going to shed light on the manipulation and subversion of human psychology in order to manufacture consent for war because they need our consent to do this. And this is what they're doing now with all the pray for Ukraine and everywhere I go, the blue and yellow and the mass psychological operation that they're doing on us to push us into this conflict. We're going to also expose the racist double standards in the treatment of quote-unquote refugees and how Africans in Ukraine are being basically pushed and marginalized by this fascist government and there's no coverage of that going on and how also migrants from Africa, from Haiti, from Honduras, from Central America that are African indigenous, they've been suffering 10 times as worse in horrible conditions, especially along the border, and yet no outrage or coverage about that. So we're going to be talking about all of that. And joining me today is Comrade Onyesanu uh, Chatouye, a longtime comrade of mine, really amazing revolutionary that I have a lot of respect for. Cadre with the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Please like and support the AAPRP, uh, especially the AAPRP New Mexico channel on YouTube. Uh, and also the All African Women's Revolutionary Union, an editor with Hood Communists. Please like and support Hood Communists, one of the best revolutionary media outlets there right now. And also a member of uh, the National Coordin Coordinating Committee for the Venceremos Brigade in solidarity with Cuba and the Cuban Revolution. How's it going, Conrad Oni? Hey, thank you so much for having me. Hey, everybody in the chat. I'm excited that I finally got to come back. Hello. Yeah. Thank you so much. It's been uh, it's been a while since you've been on, but uh, you you're one of the busiest people I know, and you're always putting in work. So uh, it's cool. It's all good, and uh, it's always an honor to have you. Uh, by the way, shout out to everybody who's watching and listening. Shout out to uh, Comrade David. Shout out to Comrade Erica Kane. Shout out to uh, Black Power Media. Shout out to uh, Dr. Jared Ball. To to everybody. To uh, Black Alliance for Peace. Shout out to uh, Ajamu Baraka. Uh, there's so many names, Miriam, Muhammad, so many people here who are watching, listening, that I really appreciate your uh, support and solidarity. And it's cool because we have a small community of people who get it, who understand it and don't fall for the lies when all of this Russia, Ukraine stuff was going on. The first people I checked out, Hood Communists, Black Alliance for Peace, AAPRP, the people who are always on top of the anti-imperialism, never fall for the spells, never fall for... Uh, the lies and the, the manipulation. Uh, it's been a really interesting experience to see how many people on the so-called left have been falling for it. Before we get into talking about all of this, uh, Comrade Oni, why don't you tell us a little bit about like your reaction, initial reaction to what's been going on with Russia, Ukraine, and your analysis of how so many so-called leftists have folded into this narrative that we have to go in and support Ukraine and support NATO basically parroting the talking points of the web, uh, military industrial complex. Well, well, first of all, my awareness of what was happening in Ukraine, specifically like the Nazis and the fascist government actually is like a couple of years old. Like I randomly saw that NATO or that nation article, uh, America's collusion with neo-Nazis, which I think came out like four years ago. So that, that's just how far back my knowledge goes. Um, and then the other thing was that Black Alliance for Peace has been consistently putting out positions like warning people like the US and NATO powers are going to escalate the situation in Ukraine to a nuclear war. We have to get them to escalate like these are demands, uphold the Minsk agreements. So that, that's that been happening for like two years. So I knew about that. And then, you know, uh, this, this, this antipathy towards Russia is very, very old. I mean, it goes back as far as the USSR, but in its modern iteration, it like, it was like sort of like metastasized by Russiagate 
which was very clearly made up from the very beginning. And so I was like kind of prepared for like like something to like to blow up, but I was not prepared for like this, like how quickly it happened, how everybody was just like on the same page. Like Putin is the next Hitler, Russia's committing ethnic cleansing, Ukraine is an innocent sovereign nation, which is not. Um, just how quickly everybody was on board. And now they're talking about no fly zones. They're talking about, they're gloating about destroying Russia's economy and people are cheering. Like the Ukraine is going like full, Nazi, like they're, they're they're tweeting about like covering bullets and like lard and stuff. Like they're just like out in the open with it and people are pretending not to see. So it's been very wild to see like how effective this like Russiagate propaganda was, like how quickly people um, were able to be like pointed in the direction that imperialism wanted them to go. And also with the Nazis, like how quickly people were like, went from like Nazis are the worst thing ever to our hearts and minds are open to Nazis. It's actually wild. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Um, I think f for me, what's been mo the most interesting is seeing the sector. You know, you and I always talk about the AstroTurf left, the fake left, the NGO mm -hmm. industrial complex left. And we always talk about how, like, for example, we're doing this right now. We're not on the clock. We're not getting paid for this. We're not in some, like, uh, open societies, NGO, whatever. We're doing this out of love for our people, our class, and the revolution. But there are some people that for them, this is a hustle. For them, this is a way to brand themselves, to find a niche. You know, I'm anti-war, I'm this and that. And it's interesting to see that sector. I don't want to name names. I could, but I, I don't want to get into that. Um, it's interesting to see those people, those sectors fold and say, you know, both sides are bad. All war is bad. Like you, you say, one of my favorite terms, flattening the contradiction making it seem like both, like there's no qualitative or quantitative difference between Russian presence in the country and U.S. and not making that distinction. And I find it interesting because even people who are so-called anti-imperialist are now repeating a lot of those talking points using um, bourgeois feminism or, you know, using liberalism. And it's been fascinating to see who's really been down for the anti-imperialist cause and who's just anti-war i think now we're openly seeing the difference between being anti-war and anti-imperialist right and i think it's something that um that has really been fascinating me uh the reason you know one of the reasons i wanted to have you on is because you published a a really amazing article recently i think it was one of the best articles summing up uh this whole ukraine russia situation and by the way, please uh, check out Hood Communist, hoodcommunist.org. Uh, this is Comrade Only's uh, amazing article on the site. Uh, it's called Imperialism and the Weaponization of Empathy. So I'm just going to read some excerpts from it, and then we'll talk a little bit more about the psychology behind mind control. This is something I like to talk about. My girlfriend playing around with me, she's always like, oh, I'm going to get you a tinfoil sombrero. Like, you're crazy. You're a conspiracy theorists, you know, <laughs> but it's like, you know, the psychological operation is real. Like this is something that they're doing with us everywhere. They're bullying people into supporting uh, pray for Ukraine and all this. And it, if any way you're critical of that, you're a Putin apologist and, and this and that. So I think this article does a, a great, a great job at breaking down the psychology. Um, so I'll just start off uh, empathy, the ability to understand and share the feelings of other beings is present in some form in most living things on Earth. Scientists theorize that empathy developed as an evolutionary strategy to build stronger bonds among animals that depend on cooperation for survival. In one particular kind of animal, humans, uh, humans, empathy is clear evidence that the claim spread by the ruling class that each of us is fundamentally cruel, self-interested, and greedy is nothing more than an attempt to naturalize the individualism and antisocial behavior that best serves their exploitative interests. In its purest form, empathy is a net positive for us on a planet where for the last several hundred years, the genocidal system of capitalism imperialism has normalized massive daily violence happening against a backdrop of apathy and ignorance. Empathy's endurance among us says that a better and more just way of living is possible despite our current conditions and that the rebuilding of that way of life of that way of living is within our capacity. However, empathy, like almost every aspect of the psyche, when we are disorganized and unconscious can be weaponized and manipulated 
by that same genocidal global system. We are witnessing this today on a grand scale. And so here you go into some of the background about the treatment of migrants, uh, Haiti, uh, the Joe Biden administration, COVID-19. Um, and later on in the article, I'm just going to skim um, skim this because there's a, a lot of really important uh, details here. Um, skipping forward to what's happening with uh, Ukraine. Uh, in order to understand what happened, it's important to understand that mass media in the U.S. is not free in any sense of the word. The platforms that are the most prominent and widely consumed by the masses here whether in print TV, movies, or radio, are tightly controlled by corporate monopolies that are themselves controlled by the global ruling class. For this reason, the messages that we are exposed to when we consume this media on a day-to-day -day basis represent first and foremost the interests and ideology of that ruling class. It doesn't matter the identity of the talking head, nor their stated politics, nor the branding of the media platform, the agenda is the same. Another important thing to understand is that for the most part, the ruling class and the petty bourgeois class that comprises the media, politicians, policymakers, public intellectuals, and other influencers uh, in, in commas within the U.S., United Snakes, I, I love that term, uh, were not in any way seriously opposed to Trump or his policies. Uh, moving forward into, um, you also mentioned the kids in cages and how they use sometimes the media to um, exploit contradictions within the ruling class. Um, and then here's where it gets really juicy. I think uh, as several contributors to Hood Communist have explained over the last few years, the attack on Ukraine's sovereignty did not begin with Russia's military intervention in February 2022. Ukraine has actually been the target of two separate U.S.-backed color revolutions targeting the same democratically elected but too friendly to Russia for the West's liking President Viktor Yanukovych in less than two decades. The first in 2004 was known as the Orange Revolution and was led by a so-called grassroots youth movement with a slick media campaign almost entirely developed by the U.S. The, its outcome was overturning the results of the 2004 election and the ascension of uh, Yushchenko, an opposition leader who pushed the European Union and NATO membership for Ukraine, as well as the imposition of IMF structural adjustment programs. The second U.S.-backed overturning of Ukraine's democratic process happened in 2014, and it saw U.S. and NATO powers forming an unholy alliance with the literal neo-Nazis and fascists who comprised the vanguard of the Euromaidan movement that would force Ukrainian President Yanukovych out of office for the second time. And then later on, you talk about some of the developments since then and how the U.S. basically has been funding these neo-Nazi battalions like the Azov Battalion. This paragraph, I think, was was so uh, hit the nail on the head. Though we are being told across every media platform to pray and stand for Ukraine, to express our unconditional solidarity to Ukraine, to definitely ignore the political power of the far right wing and literal neo-Nazis in Ukraine, we are not being told this context, The talking about the Nazis. We have been manipulated into believing that the attack on Ukraine began two weeks ago out of nowhere and that this was provoked by nothing more than the poor mental health of a broad orientalist stereotype disguised as a man. We believe we are weeping for the people of Ukraine, but really we are enraged in a false fight for their sovereignty alongside the forces who destroyed that sovereignty in the first place. Any attempt to analyze the historical and political context that led to this moment, broken agreements not to expand NATO, the US-led attacks on Ukraine's self-determination, and the US and NATO's long and uncomfortable history of knowingly colluding with fascists is met with hostility and accusations of, quote, apologism. The call from the bourgeois propaganda apparatus is to stand with Ukraine, and doing so means accepting that its history begins when the New York Times and MSNBC says so. Because of the, because the masses of people in the US are largely unconscious, not politically educated, pretty racist, and systematically trained and bribed, into aligning with white supremacy and imperialism, this works. Wow, uh, such an amazing article breaking down the psychology of it. Just before I pass it to you, uh, Comrade, only one thing that I do wanna mention is that I appreciate you explaining empathy in the beginning and why it's a good thing, because empathy is something that as human beings, as communists, we have to promote, we have to empathize with the most exploited and oppressed peoples. 
and you accurately point out how the imperialists are subverting that. So, you know, what made you write this article? What were the emotions that that uh, were going through you at the time? And your thoughts on how empathy is is being weaponized for uh, for imperialism? Um, first and foremost, it was the disparity in coverage when it came to Ukraine versus uh, the the years of protests in Haiti or like the coup in Honduras and, and like the struggle that the people waged for like nine years to elect a progressive leader. Um, uh, uh, sanctions in Zimbabwe, uh, the, the Sahel in Africa pushing the French out. Like there are all these movements, all of these, these examples of the oppression and exploitation around the world that do not get coverage in the Western media. So when you see something on the news, when you see them being like, woe is these people, feel bad for these people, like isn't this terrible? You should automatically be suspicious because the United States does not actually care about anyone's suffering. They deliberately cause suffering to increase their power, to increase their wealth. So when it's on the news and they're trying to make you feel bad, off the bat, I'm super suspicious. The other thing was just like how quickly people's attention was captured by Ukraine, specifically by the narrative they wanted to push about Ukraine. Like I pointed out in that article, Ukraine's been suffering for almost 20 years at this point at the hands of US and NATO manipulations. Um, the, the coup in 2014, in addition to putting a far right government into power, also signed, uh, that government signed Ukraine up for structural adjustment programs that destroyed its economy. They closed 60% of their public universities. Their GDP decreased by 40%. The, the heating prices in their homes increased by 50 to 60%. So the people were suffering. And then at the same time, uh, the Crimea and the regions in the Eastern, in, in Donbass, said we don't want to unite with a fascist government, we would actually rather be independent. And that fascist government proceeded to attack civilians for eight years, like tens of thousands of people have died. And that's not a part of the conversation. But now all these people have been manipulated into believing they're showing genuine solidarity with Ukraine. I'm like, your government ruined their lives. <laughs> like, I just, like, I need people to understand that the, the impulse is genuine. Like the feeling is genuine and it's positive, but you have to see how it's being like, pointed in a particular direction for a particular reason. Like you can't actually claim to genuinely care about people in Ukraine if you don't care about what's been happening for the last 20 years. If you don't want to know, know like the whole context of the story, how we got here. So yeah, it was mostly just like how this propaganda apparatus was like so powerful and able to manipulate people so clearly and to the point where if you try to point it out to them, they get like angry with you. Um, I just felt like it had to be broken down. Oh, you're muted. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's crazy how fast it happened. Like I was walking today, like I live in LA and all the high rise condos had like the Ukraine flag. And it's also interesting because you also have to question like whenever the wealthy elites, the capitalists, the bourgeois, whenever they're cheering something on, something inside you has to be like, that's fucking sus, right? Like why are all these wealthy celebrities and capitalists and businessmen rocking the Ukraine flag, uh, pray for Ukraine? And it's been really fascinating to see as well how people, even with it, like, I'm not, again, I'm not going to name names, right? But even people who have been able to build a career or express a voice on Russian media, you know, now you have RT and Sputnik that were just totally wiped off, right? And uh, and and then that during, as this is happening, they, they got bullied into the whole neither Moscow nor Washington kind of thing. And and they kind of like got pressured into that. Uh, and so I think that's so revealing of, of what's going on. And I think that's why it's important to emphasize that it's never trendy to be an anti-imperialist. It's not trendy to defend Donbass and Crimea against imperialism, but it's necessary and needed. Uh, and I'm so glad you called out the, the, ment the mental Olympics and the psychological warfare that they're waging. And I feel like one of the aspects of empathy that's important to talk about is Empathy, part of empathy is also having solidarity or care for people who perhaps are younger than you, are not abled, are a challenge in some way. Uh, and children is one of the biggest propaganda pieces for imperialism. So what I want to do is I'm going to play a clip. This is a video on The Guardian. This video already is like has uh, millions of views within days. This is one of the videos I was circulating. It's called, uh, quote, we left our dad in Kiev a young Ukrainian boy in tears after fleeing capital. So this is some of the propaganda that they're using to promote war. So I'm going to play this and we'll talk more about that. 
А папу оставили в Киеве. И папа будет продавать что-то. Будет помогать на нашим героям. Нашим войскам. Нашим войскам. Будет помогать. Может даже будет воевать. Мы шли где-то три часа, и вот вы нас спасли. Я думала, что мы уже будем идти эти два-три дня. Я, я бы думала, что мы будем идти целый день. Но вот оказалось, что вы нас выручили. Very manipulative indeed. And shout out to, by the way, shout out to Comrade Big Teal. This is so manipulative as fuck. Yeah, they bring out the kids crying and they know how to sell the war, right? Because part of marketing and branding, like one of the craziest things that you can do is read a, a marketing textbook. If you want to learn imperialism, read a marketing textbook because they tell all that shit. You have to sell the war, right? You can't just go in and bomb the crap out of Russia as they've been wanting to, to, take, to take all the oil. They have to sell it. And one of the ways that they sell it is by making it seem like Russia is the aggressor. They have they roll out these poor kids crying in tears. You know, he's talking about how my dad will be helping our heroes, our army. Well, those heroes and those army are actual Nazis, like you mentioned in the article, that uh, that wave the swastika, um, that do the Heil Hitler, that are killing uh, Russians, killing uh, non-Ukrainians. So it's insane to see that uh, your reaction to that uh, comrade only and how uh, the treatment of kids in Ukraine versus let's say for example Haitian kids or Honduran kids or African kids that that are never uh, talked about in the media yeah it just immediately made me think about the the Haitian kids that are on these deportation flights uh, that the Biden administration is sending every week hundreds of people uh, being deported back to Haiti every week tens of thousands over since the beginning of Biden's administration. And these people are like, they're like, what are you going to do about it? We're not going to give you an opportunity for appeal. We're not going to give representation. We're not even going to match you up with someone that speaks English. We're just going to deport you back to a place that we know is hell because we made it into hell. So like the idea that Western powers, the guardian actually cares about kids is not reflected by reality. And it is like pure emotional manipulation because again, they destroyed the conditions in the Ukraine with their meddling. They were the ones that put the far right and neo-Nazis into power because they were antagonistic to Russia. They were the ones that, that like manipulated Ukraine into that structural adjustment program to destroy the economy. So if you care about kids in Ukraine, why are you making it so their parents can barely afford to buy food? If you care about kids in Ukraine, why are you putting Nazis into power? Like I just, it's, it's you have to understand that this system has no conscience. And so they don't care about suffering. They don't care about death. They don't care about kids. And so when you see that shit, you have to question why you are. Yeah, and I, I thought about the, one of the images, especially of the Haitian migrants. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember this, but this was like a few months ago, I think last year. This is a uh, U.S. Border Patrol, literally uh, a old uh, white police officer, Border Patrol guy with a fucking whip on horseback at the border whipping Haitian migrants who are carrying food, no weapons, nothing. And you see them drenched after uh, crossing the Rio Grande. And it's crazy. Like, where's the aid? Where's all the, the pray for Haitian migrants at the border, right? Where's all the, uh, where's the Haitian flag being lit up? You know, where's the standing ovation for the Haitian people that are at the border? Uh, and it just shows the, the double standard, right? And how, uh, how crazy it is that, that they're doing that. And also like, the, the role of race and, and racism and how basically anybody from the global south, they're treated as differently as people from Europe. There's another clip that I wanted to share with you, uh, Comrade Only. This is from, this is like a montage of some of the racist coverage of what's happening in Ukraine. Some of the language that they're using saying that like, oh, this is Europe. This is a civilized country. So I'll play this and, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. It's very emotional for me because I see European people with blue eyes and blonde hair being killed, children being killed every day with Putin's missiles. Now with the Russians marching in, it's changed 
uh, the calculus entirely. Uh, tens of thousands of people have tried to uh, flee the city. There will be many more. People are hiding out in bomb shelters. But this isn't a place, with all due respect, um, you know, like Iraq or Afghanistan that has seen conflict raging for decades. You know, this is a relatively civilized, uh, relatively European, I have to choose those words carefully too, uh, city where you wouldn't expect that or hope that it's going to happen. Now the unthinkable has happened to them. And this is not a developing third world nation. This is Europe. As you're talking to us, Matthew, we're playing in the latest pictures of some of the refugees trying to get on trains or trying to get out of Ukraine. And, and what's compelling is just looking at them, the way they're dressed. These are prosperous, I'm looking to use the expression, these are prosperous middle class people. These are not obviously refugees trying to get away from areas in the Middle East that are still in a big state of war. These are not people trying to get away from areas in North Africa. They look like any European family that you would live next door to. These are not refugees from Syria. These are refugees from uh, neighboring Ukraine. I mean, that, is, quite frankly, is part of it. These are um, Christians, they're white. <laughs> they're Christians, they're white, and she's like, these are Europeans. It's it's crazy how openly blatant they are about their racism and their chauvinism. And it's just interesting because never a word about what the U.S. has done in North Africa, what Europe has done in North Africa, Mali, Chad, the French colonialism, never a word about the U.S. funding ISIS, Israel funding ISIS in the Middle East, in Somalia and all these places in Latin America, all the coups that they created in Haiti. And they just make it seem like Ukraine is worth salvaging and saving just because they're white and European. So it's crazy to see that, crazy to hear that. Uh, your thoughts and reaction to that, uh, Comrade Oni. First of all, someone pointed out in the comments, the very first guy that was like, they had blonde hair and blue eyes was like tan, brown eyes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> <laughs> Why are you saying this? But also, it's interesting because like Ukrainians, Eastern Europeans in general, are not considered to be on the same level as like other Europeans. Like they are racialized by other Europeans, and so now when they want to justify antagonizing Russia using these people as cannon fodder, all of a sudden they're just like us. I just want to point that out. Like they have extremely racist views towards Eastern Europeans, and those are just old as hell, as old as Europe. The other thing is that. Part of it is like definitely racist um, and it's intentional. Like they know what they're saying. It's not like slip of the tongue. They're trying to, they're weaponizing empathy, but they're also appealing to like the white supremacist, racist as hell politics of the people that they're trying to reach, like the mass of the people in Western countries. Um, so it's intentional. <laughs> they're trying to like, they're trying to like build more empathy by appealing to the race sentiment, the white identity politics. But the other thing is that the reason why you don't see um, Haitian refugees, African refugees, Central and South American refugees on the news. You don't see what's going on in Haiti. You don't see what's going on in the ground in Afghanistan, um, which, by the way, the Biden administration is like starving millions of people intentionally in Afghanistan. Um, you don't see that because they don't want you to feel empathy for Africans in Haiti. They don't want people in the United States to have consciousness of what the U.S. and the U.N. and the core group are actually doing in Haiti. They control the visibility based on like their, their imperialist objectives. They definitely do not want any kind of solidarity with Haiti, with Central and South America, with Africa. And so that's part of the reason why you're never going to see it on those platforms. They need you to have empathy with Ukrainians. And they're going like full stop for you to feel that. They don't want you to feel anything or even know anything about Africans, about indigenous people, about people from Central and South America. So it's a very, very clear systematic strategy that they're using here. Especially because a lot of the countries where in the global South that people are leaving from follow this free market capitalist system. They follow the order of Wall Street where everything is privatized, that the market decides what's best for the population and allocates commodities. And they don't need failures on their part to, because it, they're not able to sell their system, right? I feel like so so much of this is a battle of narratives and ideas. I feel like this is where warfare in the, the 21st century is so evolved because now it's a battle of narratives and optics. 
it's a battle of how you maintain your narrative of free market capitalism and imperialism, the World Bank, the IMF, how you maintain that system, how you keep selling that to the global south, and at the same time, demonizing any alternative projects like Russia, like China, like the Eurasian continental movement away from Wall Street and London, and how to slander anti-imperialist countries using color revolution techniques. Even one thing that I find really fascinating is even in the descriptions of Ukraine versus Russia, you'll note that the Ukraine flag is yellow and blue, and the Russian flag is white, blue, and red. And in so much of the art and the aesthetic, they always portray Ukraine as this bright, thriving, vibrant, colorful, artistic, unique people and Russians as these cold gray, right? Because even the colors, white, blue, red, is kind of like more plain. It's colder in Russia. They're portrayed as robotic, as cold, as evil. You never see Russian people. It's always just Russian troops in their helmets. There's so many little things to that. I had a discussion about this with John Mubaraka a few months back, actually. And we were just talking about that, like the aesthetics of the color revolution and how, you know, and especially with the Ukraine stuff, you'll see like in the protest, the women wearing like the head uh, scarf or what is like the head uh, head wrap that has like all the flowers. And mm. it's it's interesting that all that little stuff, like it doesn't seem, it, it sounds kind of dumb, right? Like when you hear it, but all those little things make a big role in how people perceive things. Even the B-roll that they show of Putin, like they'll show like, you know, a Russia, Russian invasion and it'll have like B-roll of Putin, like, or like some dumb, some dumb pose, you know what I mean? Or like, like, like all of that in, in our brain, in our minds that gets cemented in as this narrative. And like, it's crazy because I see it happening. I see the spells happening constantly every day. And it just seems like the mass hysteria around this is crazy. But what have your conversations been like with other people around this? Like, have you had any interactions or conversations with somebody who's totally buying it, who's like, pray for Ukraine and we need to go in. Like, what has that been like for you? I have mostly avoided that because I have very strong anti-imperialist community. <laughs> and so I'm yeah, either having true. conversations with regular people or I, I get them having conversations with comrades who are coming in from a similar place. But I have had a handful of interactions um, with folks who like, if you try to talk about, you know, the color revolution in 2004, the, the the far right fascist coup backed by the US and NATO in 2014. If you try to explain to them that there's been a civil war going on for eight years, tens of thousands of people are dead, they're like Putin apologists. You want more people to die? And I'm like, I'm just trying to explain to you how we got here. Like, <laughs> I didn't say anything whatsoever about Putin because it's not my place to do so. I'm just trying to explain, like if you're saying you care about Ukraine, I would like to talk about what's actually happening in Ukraine. But like people have the, the message they've been told is that this came out of nowhere. Uh, Putin is doing it just because he's a mean guy. Like he just <laughs> went nuts and he decided to to invade Ukraine. And so and so if you if you deviate that from that in any kind of way, the accusation is Putin apologist, and I've definitely been called that several times. <laughs> yeah, even like like I just Googled right now, like Putin. Um, I just Googled like in the news, right? Like uh, Putin, and it's like everything's like Putin's chilling message to. Um, Hold on, let's see if I can pull this up. Yeah, so these are some of the headlines. Right? I'm just gonna read them and look at the, look at this picture. He looks like constipated or something in this picture, but it's it's a bad it's a bad picture, right? Like they're purposely doing that on purpose. Putin's chilling warning to Russian traitors and scum is a sign things aren't going to. A, uh, for Russians against Ukraine war, Putin has a cruel warning. Putin's strange new messaging on Russian TV. Putin echoes Stalin in, quote, very, very scary speech. Ex-KGB agent reacts to Putin's, quote, terrifying remarks. So it's just like, it's just insane, right? Like, th these are all, um, these are all propaganda strategies to demonize, because it, it's like a two-headed approach, right? It's uh, demonization and empathy, right? It's demonizing the, the Russian people, demonizing Putin, right? the or as we say the pit and the pedestal right like the pit like getting the punches getting all the shit thrown at them is russia putin uh, anti-imperialist and then the pedestal is ukraine the pedestal is liberalism the pedestal is western europe and progressive values 
And it's part of that dual strategy that that we see going on, using children, right? Having the, the crying children, using bourgeois feminism, having group, groups like Pussy Riot come out and protest, using celebrities, anything you can to promote this war, to sell this war. Because in order to create this war, you need to have, it's like the the Faustian deal, right? That the, the, the deal with the devil. In order for the devil to trick you and deceive you, they have to first get your consent. They first have mm -hmm. to get you to do it to yourself. So that, oh, you did that. It's kind of like Iraq, right? Like with after 9-11, I think we're both old enough to remember that it was like, oh, um, you know, building up this momentum and anger after 9-11. It's like, look what they did. We have to go in there and bomb them. And people are like, yeah. And it, it first of all, like this is a whole nother conversation for something else. But there's a lot of shady shit with 9-11. First of all, that's number one. Number two, uh, it wasn't even fucking Iraq to begin with. Right. Uh, and the people who, in Iraq and, and Syria and Iran those are the people fighting Daesh and ISIS and the people and Saudi Arabia. So we got duped into this war based on false information, based on emotion. And that's the best way to control people. The best way to control people is, like you said in the article, through strong emotions, empathy, fear, all of these things. And it's just it's just so uh, insane. Uh, sometimes I feel like I'm crazy because like so many you know, I don't I try to avoid talking to liberals or neocons, but when I do have to interact with people like that, I feel like I'm fucking crazy and and mm -hmm. everybody else is just repeating pray for Ukraine, pray for Ukraine. And it's just like um, the level of uh, mass delusion uh, with all of this is crazy. But uh, what I'm going to do, I'm, I'm going to play a clip. This is from Zelensky's speech to Congress where he got a standing ovation. Uh, and then we'll break down some more of how they weaponize empathy for imperialism. I'm proud to greet you from Ukraine, from our capital city of Kiev, a city that is under missile and airstrikes from Russian troops every day. But it doesn't give up. Russia has turned the Ukrainian sky into a source of death for thousands of people. Russian troops have already fired nearly 1,000 missiles at Ukraine, countless bombs. They use drones to kill us with precision. This is a terror that Europe has not seen, has not seen for 80 years, and we are asking for a reply, for an answer uh, to this uh, terror from the whole world. Is this a lot to ask for, to create a no-fly zone, zone over Ukraine to save people? Is this too much to ask? Humanitarian no-fly zone, something that Ukraine, uh, that Russia would not be able to terrorize our free cities. If this is too much to ask, we offer an alternative. You know what kind of defense systems we need, S-300 and other similar systems. You know how much depends on the battlefield, on the ability to use aircraft. They do not defend our people. I have a dream. These words are known to each of you today. I can say, I have a need. I need to protect uh, our sky. I need your decision, your help. I'm grateful to President Biden for his personal involvement, for his sincere commitment to the defense of Ukraine and democracy all over the world. I am grateful to you for the resolution which recognizes all those who commit crimes against Ukraine, against the Ukrainian people as war criminals. However, now, it is true, in the darkest time for our country, for the whole Europe, I call on you to do more. The destruction of our country, the destruction of Europe. All American ports should be closed for uh, Russian goods. We, um, peace is more important than income. We propose to create an association, you 24 united for peace a union of responsible countries that have the strength and cons consciousness to stop conflicts immediately provide all the necessary assistance in 24 hours if necessary even weapons if necessary sanctions humanitarian support political support finances everything you need to keep the peace and quickly save the world to save lives today it's not enough to be the leader of the nation today it takes to be the leader of the world being the leader of the world means 
to be the leader of peace. Peace in your country doesn't depend anymore only on you and your people. It depends on those next to you, on those who are strong. As the leader of my nation, I am addressing the President Biden. You are the leader of the nation, of your great nation. I wish you to be the leader of the world. Being the leader of the world means to be the leader of peace. Thank you. Slava Ukraine. So that's some crazy <laughs> shit. Crazy He's like glory to Ukraine repeating the Nazi slogans. Being the, being the leader, we need you to be the leader of the world. Uh, the policeman of the world calling for the U-24 to bomb the crap out of countries in 24 hours, uh, saying that sanctions and weapons will save the world, saying, I need your help. I'm calling on you to do more, asking for a no-fly zone. Uh, comrade, only your reaction to that. Like, if you know the full context of the situation, then you realize this man is not a hero. This man is, like, at best an opportunist who is allowing his people to be, like, all of this could have been prevented had the Minsk agreements been upheld. This man instead chose to be a puppet of the West to like be submissive to neo-Nazis. And this is why the Ukraine is in the situation it's in. So if you actually know him, he's no hero. And now he's like quoting MLK. He's like calling for the US to be the leader of the world. He's calling for weapons in a no-fly zone, which is going to risk a nuclear war, drastically escalate the situation and cost more lives. I read an article today uh, from the United Nations talking about the longer this war goes on in Ukraine, the more uh, 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 the more that Ukraine will be plunged into poverty. So it's going to have a really intensely negative impact on the masses of people in Ukraine, on his people. And like the whole situation could be ended if they would just re like agree to remain neutral, take the Nazis out of power and stop allowing the U.S. to use them to antagonize Russia. And he's going along with it. He's going along with it. And he's using, like, that was a very poorly written speech. I don't even understand why the I Have a Dream speech reference was in there, except to manipulate people. The glory to Ukraine, which is a neo-Nazi slogan at the end, it's just, like, so cynical and so manipulative. And you put up, um, you know, Putin is, like, demonized. Putin is, like, acting like he's the next Hitler, like he's a demon. But you put up on the screen someone saying, like, Putin gives speeches um, and, like, talk without any paper in front of him. And actually, like, I have, like, for the first time in my life, I've been starting to read Putin's speeches, like the speech he gave on February 24th, announcing the military action. If you listen to the Western media, he was, like, the next Stalin. Talk about he wants to rebuild the USSR. If you actually read the speech, over half the speech is talking about uh, how NATO is a direct threat to Russia and why. He explains in detail in each of the speeches he's given what's happening, what Russia wants, why it got to this point. Like, he explains for hours, and Zelensky is just talking in, like, trite platitudes, phrases, cliches, while, to be honest, visibly high. And, like, it's like he's a hero. It makes no sense. The crazy part about it is, like, this is the kind of trippy part for me, is that he was the also a comedian, and he was a, an actor, and he was in a show called Servant of the People, where the, the plot of the show was that he was Ukraine's president and that he was the leader during all these big crises. And it's crazy to see how he's just like this puppet that's being put on the pedestal. He's this hero. He's this amazing guy. And the script, like it's like this script that they've been rehearsing for years is just now coming to life and, and they're carrying it out today. And I think people also need to really check out, like you said, Putin's speeches, his writings, his conversations, because nobody ever shows that. And none of the coverage of Ukraine, Russia, do you ever hear any sound bites from Putin? It's always just an image of him looking mean, him, you know, kind of being tough looking. And if you hear his his speeches and talks, it's really interesting, you know, he, him talking about uh, denazifying Ukraine, him talking about maintaining peace. And it's very clear in his speeches, he talks about not wanting to invade, because if you think about it tactically, right, it doesn't make sense to just wake up one day, invade and bomb all of Ukraine. Like this is for a specific mission to save ethnic Russians who are in Donbass, in all parts of Ukraine that are being killed, that have been subject to terror for many years since the coup. 
uh, one of the comparisons I like to make is comparing it to the U.S. and Mexico. Like right now, you know, I'm talking to you from L.A., Southern California, which used to be part of Mexico, which was stolen uh, from Mexico and indigenous peoples by the U.S. right in the in the 1800s after the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo. And let's say hypothetically, if there was a genocide of Mexicans here in L.A., and let's say hypothetically there was an anti-imperialist government in Mexico, and it would be like Mexicans in L.A. reaching out to that government in Mexico would be like, hey, they're fucking killing us. They have been killing us for years. We need some help. And you're in a predominantly Mexican area, like the, the neighborhood I'm in, like the city I'm in is like majority Mexican. That makes sense, right? Because you're literally on the border. Ukraine, the eastern Ukraine is on the uh, border with Russia. Uh, it would make sense for the Mexican government because it has an interest to save its people in that country that was stolen anyway, right? Just like eastern Ukraine. Uh, it, it makes sense. But when you don't have that background, when you don't listen to uh, Putin's talks or listen to any alternative voices, Russian or whatever, you're not going to have that narrative. And that's why I tell people, like, take the time to read non-Western sources, take the time to actually listen to their speeches, uh, because that's what you should be doing. Um, because oftentimes the portrayal we have of Putin, of the Russians is is so false in, in mainstream media. So, um, you know, it's just it's just really insane to to see like how they're doing all that. Uh, one thing I also want to do, I, I want to play a clip. This is a clip about racism against Africans in Ukraine. There's actually a big African community, especially a lot of Nigerians in Ukraine who study there. And obviously that's because also the legacy of the Soviet Union. The only reason that there's infrastructure and education in schools in Ukraine is because of socialism, because of the Soviet system uh, that, that built that. Um, so there's a, a long history of Africans studying uh, in Ukraine and Russia. So this is a clip about some Africans who have been uh, discriminated against in Ukraine. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. The tiny village of Zahan on the Hungarian border with Ukraine is basically just a train station. Now, though, becoming a major transit point out of Ukraine. Nigeria students, 50 people, please come with me. Nigerian embassy officials are here, for example, transporting hundreds of people to Budapest, mainly students who've been walking for days. The people we spoke to said they'd come out via Hungary in order to avoid the Ukrainian-Polish border exit points to the west. Budapest. Suddenly, word spreads the train on Platform 1 is leaving for Budapest. Even here on the border, war too close for comfort. It's a false alarm, though. Turns out the train isn't leaving for another four hours. So plenty of time to hear stories of the journey to the border. Like Victor's, a medical student in Kyiv, and his friend, Alao. I'm a brain surgeon uh, resident. I don't think I've ever met a brain surgeon properly before. <laughs> Victor first went to the Polish border with Ukraine to the west, but says he was told by a Ukrainian border guard that the policy was one foreigner allowed through for every 10 Ukrainians. They said uh, they, uh, they had a protocol for the entry to the border and the protocol was that, uh, you know, 10 number of the Ukrainian Ukrainians. locals to uh, one number of foreigners Foreigner. to gain entrance to the uh, Polish border. Did a border guard say that to you? Yes, a few of them. The lady who works with the border guard said that. We are not allowing any black people to enter inside the gates. Many of the students we spoke to said they'd come south to the Hungarian border because of phone footage like this from border crossings into Poland. We are students! We are students! Videos purporting to show foreigners being treated differently by Ukrainian border guards at the long queues going west into Poland something the UN's High Commissioner for Refugees has acknowledged was happening. So it's crazy. I think the biggest insane thing, as uh, where Pogrom uh, mentioned, a 1 to 10 ratio, that's the, the biggest fucking most fucked up racist shit because it basically is saying that Africans mean one tenth of the average Ukrainian by saying that 10 to 1 ratio. And it, I think it's important to hear that because there's some people uh, on the left or some uh, in 
colonized black indigenous communities who say, you know, that's a white man's uh, war that doesn't impact us. But in 2022, our world is so interconnected. There's Africans in Ukraine studying. Uh, there's Latinos in Ukraine, believe it or not. There's everybody is everywhere. And we have to study and learn about situations like that because it reveals the latent racism and classism of the Ukrainian fascist government and how they treat other uh, nationalities and, and, and people of color in their borders who are not Ukrainian. Uh, so I think it's important to show that, right? Because it just shows the nature. If it were uh, a different government, if it was like Cuba or a revolutionary government, uh, it, it treats migrants very differently than uh, than than Ukraine does. Um, comrade, only your reaction to that and, and just kind of wrapping up here also, like uh, what advice do you have for, you know, people who are new to this? Because I think a lot of people, for a lot of people, this is their first time kind of learning about what's been happening in Donbass and Ukraine. Like we've been following this for years, uh, but for a lot of people, this is like the first time that they're really learning about this. Your advice for them and just your overall analysis of uh, empathy and the psychology of, of imperialism. Well, in terms of the African students, um, once it became clear that it was the Ukrainian military and Ukrainian police forces that were preventing them from boarding the trains and buses, that was like a turning point in how African people assess what was happening in Ukraine. Because what we've been told is that we needed to empathize with these people, that they were suffering innocent people. And then, you know, the plight of the African students was revealed first on social media. And by the way, like there's this, this Negro, Terrell Starr, that works for the Atlanta Council that's embedded with right side here in Ukraine who, and there's also this other African woman, some academic that claims to be a Ukraine expert. But when the stories first came out, those Africans immediately leapt to discredit, to say it was like Russian propaganda. And then that line started to spread until there were too many students speaking out. There were so many of them that it became clear that it was actually true. But the initial response from these like puppets of the imperialist government, like the Atlantic Council as the PR arm of NATO, was to attempt to discredit the story, even though we know it's true. So that's like one example of how like the, the coverage is being manipulated in this case. But with the African students, once our people saw what was happening, we were like, something is not, something's not right, something's off. So in, in a way it was like positive, it's negative what's happening to them, but the coverage, particularly these students speaking out on social media was extremely positive because it was an opening for African people to question the narrative. And now we try to explain to them about the 2014 coup. We try to explain to them about, you know, the forces who are actually in power in Ukraine, they see it, they understand it. So I'm grateful that like the, the propaganda apparatus fumbled in this case because the students spoke up for themselves. Um, but in terms of like the, the weaponization of empathy overall and like how folks who are like new to anti-imperialist politics can like uh, assess what's actually happening. Like I'm a, a really big believer in like getting the, the full context. Like don't just get a soundbite of what's happening on the news and then push it to like take a position based on that. Like actually try to understand what's been happening in an area going like five years back, 10 years back, 20 years back. Like if you do any kind of research into Ukraine, it's like not hard at all to find the Nazis. Like every time people try to downplay it, I'm like, you have not looked into it because it is clear, it is obvious, it is well-documented. So like use primary sources, use on the ground accounts to develop a full understanding of the political and historical context that led up to a present moment. Understand that things like this don't just happen. There's no such thing as, you know, like this James Bond villain type of world leader. Like the US to be frank is like the closest to that that exists. But like in general, like world leaders are not James Bond villains, like caricatures, like monsters who just act with no no rational impulse. You, you can understand why these things are happening if you take the time to understand the political conditions on the ground. The other thing I would say is that you can't go wrong um, by being a part of an anti-imperialist, preferably a socialist political organization where you can get a foundation of like ideological knowledge. Like right now in the APRP work study in the, in the Southwest chapter, we're reading Lenin's imperialism. And that book is like really the blueprint for understanding like why these world conflicts happen, who is actually in power within the global economic system and why, what that means, what that looks like. You need that ideological foundation to like peep the game. Once you understand like that the US is an empire, that the US is by far the most powerful entity on this planet at this point in time, then you begin to understand that the narratives they tell about the rest of the world are always gonna be about suiting their interests and are not gonna accurately reflect what's happening. So like being a political organization, 
develop that ideological foundation, develop like an actual understanding of what imperialism is, and then use that lens to do your research when these things burst into the news, whether it's about Ukraine, whether it's about Haiti, whether it's about Honduras, about Nicaragua, about Zimbabwe, like actually understand what's happening on the ground. Because once you push yourself to get that full context, it cannot trick you anymore. Yeah, no, definitely. Uh, shout out to uh, Comrade Gino in the chat. That's kind of funny. One weird trick to assess what's happening for lazy people. Listen <laughs> to what the U.S. says, believe the opposite. I'm not going to lie. I do that shit too. Or I'm like, okay, what's the U.S. saying? What's mainstream media saying? Uh, I'm going to look into the other side. But yeah, thanks thanks for your honesty uh, there, Comrade Gino. Uh, by the way, we're looking at a picture. I share this every stream of Ukraine and Russia that, that I've been doing. Uh, it's important to share this image because they've been trying to scrub this image from the internet. This is an image of the Azov Battalion, an official wing of the Ukrainian Armed Forces. And in the picture, they have the German swastika from the Nazi Germany era. They have the flag of NATO and the Ukrainian Azov Battalion flag. They have weapons. They're doing the Heil Hitler sign. This is, these are the, pray, when you're saying pray for Ukraine and when you're saying stand with Ukraine, these are the people that you're supporting. So if you consider yourself progressive, you, if you consider yourself anti-war, know that by saying that you're supporting these people, you know, and uh, I, I I think it's important to share this image far and wide. And, and even I've been thinking about like printing it out and fucking just putting it all over the city or something, just because people haven't seen this and, and they're trying to scrub this off the internet. They're censoring channels. Like, it's crazy. I'm, you know, I, I was thinking about that today. I was like, oh, shit, what if they, like, delete my channel? But whatever, uh, I have it backed up. Um, so, you know, it's important to get as much information out there. Uh, and I'm really glad you mentioned Lenin's imperialism, the high stage of capitalism. I really implore people to read that because you'll also understand why there is no such thing as, quote, unquote, Russian imperialism in the 21st century because imperialism, one of the biggest mistakes that people make is that they confuse imperialism with any sort of military operation that's overseas or in a different country. A lot of people were saying, oh, Russian imperialism because Russia helped Syria defeat uh, Islamic State or because you have a Chinese base, you know, or a Chinese business in Africa. So like Chinese imperial, you know, imperialism is at its root financial, it's economic. It's parasitic capitalism, banking institutions. It's monopoly capitalism. It's when you have, it would be different if Russian banks were purposefully indebting Ukraine, purposely indebting uh, African countries with high interest rates, monopolizing the inter industry where there are no Ukrainian businesses or African businesses or Latin American businesses. And you could only buy Russian products. You can only use Russian currency. You can only work through Russian financial institutions, that is not the case. In fact, Russia, China, Iran, all these countries are helping to build independent infrastructure for all these countries around the world. And they're not making people dependent on the ruble or the, the Moscow stock exchange. So that's not how imperial, just because Russia has troops in a different country, by invitation, by the way, by the local population, that's not imperialism. So, you know, I really tell people, like, really understand what imperialism is, because now, these liberal, annoying ass fucking pray for Ukraine liberals are all like Russian imperialism, anti-war. Like they're branding themselves now as as the anti-imperialists and all this. So we have to, as anti-imperialism, we have to defend our shit. We have to be like, no, like what is imperial? You tell me, explain to me what is imperialism. You're wrong. Like that's not imperialism, and this is this is what we mean. So you know, I'm really glad you mentioned that, uh, comrade. Only I really appreciate. Uh, your analysis. Everybody, please check out uh, Comrade Only's article, Imperialism and the Weaponization of Empathy on hoodcommunist.org, an amazing site, amazing organization. Uh, Comrade Only is a cadre with the All African People's Revolutionary Party. Uh, shout out to AAPRP. Please subscribe to AAPRP New Mexico and all AAPRP channels uh, and the All African Women's Revolutionary Union. Editor with Hood Communist. Shout out to Hood Communist and the uh, National Coordinating Committee for the Venceremos Brigade in solidarity with Cuba. Uh, shout out to everybody who's watching and listening. Uh, thank you all so much. Thank you so much, uh, Comrade Only. I hope to have you back on. Any uh, last words you want to say or anything you want to plug before you head out? I just want to say join the organization and build that anti-imperialist community because in moments like this, taking the anti-imperialist position will get you attacked 
But if you have that foundation, if you have that community, you can withstand it and you'll take the correct position. Most definitely. Uni uh, strength and uh, unity and, and don't cower down. Don't be scared of these liberals. In a few months, I'm telling you, all these people, the narrative is going to switch. And all these people who said they were down for solidarity to Russia, uh, you know, we'll look back a few months ago and they will probably had to pray for you, Crane tweet with the yellow and blue. So uh, thank you so much, uh, Comrade Only. It's been a pleasure speaking with you. Uh, we're going to go out to some uh, some revolutionary music from uh, the, the great Bob Marley. Uh, peace out, everybody. Thank you for watching and listening and uh, take care. Yeah.